Welcome back everyone, Oz here. Today I'm pulling more videos out of the archive so y'all can enjoy them. These ones are from almost five years ago and they're the pro-revenge stories, some of them being nuclear revenge. I always did enjoy recording these ones more than the Entitled Parents ones, so if these ones are actually still enjoyed to this day, then I have no problem with bringing this back with some modern uploads. Anyways, don't forget I use code Oz at checkout with Gamersups and uh, let's get onto it. Roommate lacks the will to get up on his own. I see a lot of hot-blooded revenge stories lately where huge crap storms are stirred up and someone gets fired or arrested. My story is cold-blooded revenge, where a small and deliberate action makes my victim lose out. My first semester at college, I had a roommate who was a pain in the butt. He made up honor code rules to tell us we weren't allowed to watch movies or listen to music he didn't like, didn't realize food wasn't his, stayed up past curfew with friends over being loud, didn't help clean the dorm for inspections, and had a consistent holier-than-thou attitude because of his religion. I'm pretty calm and I rarely ever get even, but after a semester of his nonsense, I had no issue with revenge. He was going to study music, but failed the entrance audition to an important class and needed to take another two credits in order to keep his scholarship. So, he joined the social dance class I was taking at 7.45am every other day. A couple of weeks in, he decides to set his alarm for 6.15am, 15 minutes before I get up. My morning habit is very tight. Wake up at 6.30, shower, change, eat, and walk to class, arriving with 5 minutes to spare. His morning habit is, allow the alarm to play for 5-10 to 10 minutes before turning it off, go back to sleep until I finish showering and come back into the room, then get up, shower, and leave just a few minutes after me, arriving right as class starts. I deal with it for a while, and he even acknowledges that it's probably annoying and I should turn it off since I don't get up anyway. He doesn't. I figured I could just use his habit against him. He was essentially Pavlov trained to wake up when I came back into the room. So, in the last two weeks of the semester, I changed my routine slightly. I would eat before showering, that made it so I came back into the room just a few minutes before leaving and with just enough time to walk to class. He, not realizing it was so late, took his shower and arrived at class with only a few minutes left, getting an absent for the day. The dance department has a very strict rule that four unexcused absences is an automatic fail. Roommate doesn't remember this rule. He continues to rely on me coming into the room to wake him up. He continues being absent for the last four days of class. His first semester report card gets an F, which brings his GPA too low to get his scholarship the next year. Hope you enjoyed. I know I did. If you guys, um are thinking what I'm thinking, you should look up the uh, the Office Pavlov prank. That, that's that's just what comes into my mind after reading this, is that scene from The Office. It's a pretty good scene. The bully kid destroys the friendship between all his tormentors. 2007, fourth grade, that was when my classmates first started bullying me. It started out as just name calling, which I just ignored, but as time passed, the name calling turned to more physical bullying, pushing, punching, gang ups, and whenever the snowy season was around, I was the prime target for snowballs, which occasionally had ice chunks or even rocks inside. This went on for years, and as it went on, more and more kids started bullying me. Even kids from other classes in my year were joining in. Teachers knew I was getting bullied, but never did anything about it beyond giving my tormentors a stern talking to. My parents knew and did try to talk to my teachers and other kids' parents about it, but it did not help. And again, only resulted in kids getting a stern talking to. And every time someone was given a talking to, the bullying would intensify for a few days because I was a tattletale. The idea of changing schools had been mentioned, but I grew up in a smallish town that only had two schools within a reasonable distance, and because of something, those two schools did not currently accept transfers from each other. I know this sounds stupid, and it is, but it will make a little more sense later. Fast forward to about halfway through 7th grade. The physical bullying had slowed down and eventually stopped entirely. I suspect, in part, because I was now one of the tallest kids in my year. The bullying reverted back to name calling, but the worst was the fact that at this point I was completely alone. I had no friends and everyone in the school knew to just ignore the gloomy lonely kid. I spent every recess either sitting alone somewhere or walking around the school area, just waiting for the next lesson to start. It was at this point I realized something about my just ignore him status that I could use. No one cared about what I did or didn't know. 
people would openly have conversations with each other about their dirty secrets while I sat a table away well within earshot. Soon enough, I knew an absolutely stupid amount of secrets that groups of friends in my class were keeping from each other. And better yet, I knew of people who had been told things in confidence and then shared those secrets to others, and I had it all written down. Now this was all still mostly pretty kitty stuff. Like, boy A said this about boy B, or girl A told this secret to girl B, but then girl B shared that secret with girl C. But there was a lot of it. And there were some pretty serious things mixed in too. Now, the reason why those two schools were not accepting transfers from each other was because there was currently a years-long process of merging the two schools into one, under a new name, what was actually happening is that because the other school's building was becoming moldy to the point where kids were getting sick from how bad the air inside some parts of the building was, it had to close down. And my school was getting a massive expansion to accommodate the increase of students, calling it a merge just made the transfer of students and school staff easier. Because the school was getting a new name, all the students were on paper transferring to the new school. And because of that, students could not transfer between the two. Hence the something I mentioned earlier. It's dumb. I know. Anyway, the merge would happen between the school years of 2011 and 2012. And this meant that students from each year from each school were going to be rearranged into new classes. For my class, it meant that after 8th grade, no one knew if they would still be classmates. So, on the last day of 8th grade, every student from my class was called to the assembly hall first thing in the morning. They were going to have assemblies for each class in the 8th, 7th, and 6th years for that day, but they stopped after my class. The principal gave a speech about welcoming the new students and not letting this hurt the friendships we had already established with each other. I had to fight my own urge to laugh while the friendship part of the speech was going on because I was planning something good. At the end of his speech, the principal asked, Do any of you have anything to share? And allowed students to come up onto the stage and talk into the microphone. Some gave heartfelt goodbyes, some even cried, some just made dumb jokes, and as the last one, I grabbed my stuff, backpack, jacket, etc., walked onto stage, grabbed my little notebook from my backpack, and started reading out loud. Every single dirty little secret into the microphone. All the little betrayals, all the broken promises, all the things no one wanted their friends to know about, a year and a half of me just sitting nearby and hearing things was brought out into the light. It started before I was even done reading. The two teachers that had accompanied us to the assembly and the principal were desperately trying to calm things down. Best friends were screaming and yelling at each other. Some were getting physical, beating each other up, chairs were getting thrown. It was chaos. It was so much chaos that no one stopped me from just grabbing my stuff and leaving through the backstage exit with the biggest fuck oh. grin on my face I've ever had. I left school grounds and went home. And I don't know how that situation ended. When ninth grade started, the merge had happened. I was put in a class with none of my old classmates. None of my old teachers taught my new class. I managed to make a few new friends among the students from the other school and never saw any consequences for what I did. I don't know why the teachers let me get away with it. I guess they understood why I did it and just wanted to forget it happened. What I do know is that none of my classmates were friends anymore, and I do not regret any part of this. Ugh, don't mess with the quiet ones, holy crap. Neighbors ran over our fence. Dad installed a concrete fence that wrecked eight of their cars. We live in a small private neighborhood. The neighbors are related to us more or less, distant relatives, Everybody here is a complete nutjob. They were constantly arguing over decades before me or my brother were born. Our property line is kind of like a square and it is surrounded by a road from two sides. Keep in mind that on one part of the road, we let our neighbors use one square meter of the land so they can use the road safer and not damage our property. This is crucial information. This road is made of gravel. The neighbors want my parents and only my parents to pay for the entire cost to lay in an asphalt road. My dad and mother are constantly fixing potholes for 90% of the road, so naturally our neighbors thought that they will pay for the asphalt road. Classic choosing beggars. Fast forward 20 years, the road remains gravel-ish. Nobody wanted to pay for the asphalt road. One day, my neighbors order a massive truck filled with tons of wood. The truck driver runs over our fence. 
Nobody wanted to pay for the damage. Our fence is made out of multiple bushes, trees, and a little bit of metal fence too. These plants were now completely destroyed and a part of the metal fence completely bent. We had to replant these plants and place a new metal fence. My father told me this was not the first time this happened, but actually the third. I couldn't believe it when I heard this. So this is where the revenge begins. My father is a police officer in the department where they mostly handle frauds, drug busts, etc. He knows the law well. He dug up the property line marker and placed plastic barrels filled with rocks on our property. In the next six hours, three of our neighbors came knocking on the door because they hit our plastic barrels filled with rocks. They were angry and wanted to call the cops, but they never did because everybody knew that little part of the land was still our property. One neighbor in particular threatened my dad that he will throw a pickaxe at my father's back. Over the period of one year, these neighbors hit the barrels so much with their cars that the barrels were now completely worthless. My dad was furious and he changed his petty revenge into a pro revenge. He cut some wood to use as a mold, he bought cement, sand, and metal poles. One peaceful afternoon, my father and I cemented that whole part of the land and placed some lovely flowers on top, so when they hit the concrete, they can smell our flowers of victory and defeat. As we expected, five neighbors in total wrecked their cars on the new fence and nobody came knocking on the door. In case you all were curious, here's a picture of that concrete wall. Threaten my son, lose your money. I left my ex-husband with our then five-year-old son when we were going to be evicted as a result of his gambling and addiction issues. My son and I ended up living in a friend's dining room and stayed there for about six months until we moved into a room of our own. About three months after we had left, I took my son back to visit with X. When I picked my son up, I saw a state lottery bag in X's car. X had won a pretty big lottery award a few years before, which just fueled the gambling addiction and he ran through it in a couple of months. So I recognized this as a swag bag you get from when you're a big winner. When my son and I got back to my friend's place, I did some digging and found X had won about 250000 two months to the day after my son and I had been forced to move. We were still married, and no one had filed for divorce yet. About a week before, I found out he had a new girlfriend, who he was conveniently seeing while we were still living together. That will be relevant later. I confronted him and told him I didn't even want half, just enough to get my son and I settled and start over. But he was furious I found out and threatened to take my son as I couldn't afford to take care of him. And now he could! I was understandably upset and was freaking out to a friend right after the confrontation. Now, my ex had two kids with a prior ex to whom he owed thousands in back child support. My friend just asked, what's her number? I was still sobbing and shaking and gave it to her. My friend called and said, hello prior ex, this is OP's friend. Just thought you'd want to know ex-husband just won $250,000 in the lottery. Have a nice night. Prior X immediately called me to see what that was about. I told her what had happened, and we came up with a plan. I was meeting one last time with X, who'd agreed to pay off the title loan on my car that I'd taken out to pay our rent while we were still together. I was to meet at his bank. He'd give me the cash, and I would take the cash to pay off the loan. As soon as he handed me the money, I texted Prior X the name of the bank. She filed a garnishment and very soon after, his accounts were frozen. He texted me furious, I told Prior X, and I just said, You threatened to take my son because I didn't have the money to care for him. But you did. Now, you don't. Prior X ended up getting what was left. That was a month later and only about 90k was left. And the court made new girlfriend pay Prior X the money X had given her for rent and various gifts, which Prior X then sent to me. Not much, but a huge help when you're starting over. It's been almost five years now. New girlfriend is still just girlfriend, even though they got engaged before I even knew she existed. And, again, before anyone filed for a divorce. And she utterly despises me and prior ex. We're both cool with it. Before you comment about how it was this dude's money and he was entitled to it, she took out a loan to pay for the rent that they were both sharing at the time, that they were still married, so she was owed technically half of it, he was cheating on her and was engaged to someone else while they were married. I mean, just all of this in general. <laughs> the dude's a scumbag. There's also a limerick too long didn't read in the comments, so let's have some fun. My gambling ex got us evicted, so leaving was hardly conflicted. He won a big prize, and so with some lies, sought maternal rights, fensely constricted. My friend made a call to X Prime and cooked up a scheme in no time. His plan lost its varnish when his accounts got a garnish. 
twas truly worth dropping the dime. Wife cheats on their husband, abuses their children, and lies on court. Enjoy not having your kids anymore. Good day, you know the deal. English now first language, mobile yada yada. It's also my first post, so be gentle, please. For cast, we have mom, empty human, S, sister, me, and my dad. I have no concrete dialogue for this story since it happened about four years ago, and I pretty much want to forget about it. Now, some background. My mother is not exactly the best person in the world. She used to abuse me and S both physically and mentally, mostly mentally. Avoid responsibilities at home and she also decided to cheat on my dad with several men around 13 years ago, and never stopped. When my father discovered this, he simply stopped sleeping in the same room and stopped being affectionate towards her. He stayed with her for us, S and I, and decided to raise us basically alone since my mom was always outside with her partners. My mother used to simply arrive home to eat, sleep, and hurt me or my sister. The rest of the day she claimed to be working overtime. However, all the money she made was kept away for herself, and my father had to do real overtime to take care of us, and he was tired of not getting any help. Here's where my dad's revenge plan starts. He stayed quiet for a long time, managing work and parenting very well, but in the meantime, he was collecting all the evidence he could about my mom cheating as well as evidence of abuse towards sister and I. And he also kept supporting us, teaching us how to stand up for ourselves and each other, helping us understand how bad mom's behavior was and we don't need to justify her bad treatment just for being our mother. He kept being the best person he could for about 10 years until sister and I were old enough to testify in court. Then he immediately filed for divorce and got it very easily since mom kept lying about how he was abusing me and my children. But of course, he had proof of her cheating and being the abuser, so they got divorced. But the plan didn't end there, since he wanted us to live with him. My dad left our house immediately after the divorce, and two weeks later, I moved with him. My sister stayed with mom. Let's skip some months until the court date to discuss the kid's custody. About six months prior, my mother lied about me living with her, so she could get that sweet child support check. But, when the court date arrived, sister and me testified against her, explaining how bad of a mother she was, etc. And I said I have been living with my dad for months, contrary to what my mother has said. Of course, she wanted to play the victim with lies, which we refuted. The judge was not having it and told her that she needed to stop lying because she was being fined for lying to a judicial authority. Of course, she lost our custody and she was forced to return the child support money to us. Now she lives alone and sometimes tries to play the forgive me I know I did wrong card with us only to ask for money right after. But none of us want to see her again. Not exactly a massive sweet and evil revenge but after I told my dad about this sub he told me I should post the story. I hope it actually belongs here. The client is not always right. This just happened. Couldn't wait to get home and post. I'm on cloud 9. Long read. Too long didn't read at the bottom. I work at a big ad agency with large companies as our clients. We expect to work in partnership with our clients. We fire clients that treat us poorly. Usually, we treat each other with respect. Our biggest client has five different teams we work with, and one of them was led by Baseball Dad. BD was the type of neckless marshmallow who gets wasted at his kid's baseball game and starts heckling the other kids. Just a boorish asshole. He never approved any of our work, putting out awful stuff that his internal team made even though he is literally paying us millions of dollars to make ads for him. His product was struggling to sell and he blamed us, even though we were killing it with the other four teams. He didn't know this, which comes back to bite him later. However, none of this is why we needed revenge. I don't give a shit if a client wants to fail. I collect my paycheck regardless. However, he crossed several lines. 1. He was extremely sexist. He used to call my female co-workers sweetheart in the most condescending voice, commented on their clothes, bodies, and wink smirk at me when they were talking because we were both men, I guess. These women are highly accomplished, serious people, and they are like family to me. Huge misplay on his part. 2. Baseball Dad was abusive to us. He would constantly interrupt us, tell us to shut up, call us vendors, and remind us he could fire us at any time. 3. BD would lie. He would tell his boss, actual nice guy but too busy to check closely, that we missed deadlines or forgot deliverables because he never checked his email. We would then have to awkwardly struggle to prove Baseball Dad wrong without calling him a liar so we could keep the business. He never owned up to anything he said to us on the phone. 4. The final straw took place on a call between Baseball Dad and one of my project managers. I saw her run out of a room crying. She told me Baseball Dad said to her, 
in a one-on-one -on -one call that she should worry less about budgets and more about wearing that nice top she wore at our last presentation. Gross. Revenge time. I told my cool boss that our team had enough of Baseball Dad. We were at our wits end with his shit. Several of my coworkers were looking for new jobs. It's hard to hire good people. So my boss asked me to give her a day to figure this out. She wanted to lose BD without losing the entire business. The next day, she showed up with our IT guy, who set up a voice recording on our conference line. It's illegal to record people without consent in my state, but Baseball Dad was late to every call. Too bad, because if he had showed up on time, he would have heard the new message kicking off every call. This call is being recorded. His team heard it and had no problem with it. I suspect they hated him too. For the next two weeks, we recorded everything. Every word of it. One of my audio engineers made a super cut of every terrible thing Baseball Dad said. Every, sweetheart, shut up, no one cares what you think. My project manager even baited him into repeating what he said about her clothes on a budget call. This time, he literally said, you're much better at flirting than budget, sweetheart. That's why I like you. The supercut sounded insane when played all together. It was an incredible piece of evidence. We sent it to his boss and his vice president and threatened to walk away from the work two weeks before product launch if Baseball Dad wasn't disciplined. They immediately apologized and begged us not to leave. They said it would be handled by Monday. My one sweet project manager, he had been so gross to, got the best part of the revenge. She anonymously sent the supercut to his wife using the email address she had posted on LinkedIn. I don't know what became of that, but I imagine it wasn't good. On Monday, Baseball Dad wasn't on the call. My boss snooped and found out that he had a few complaints prior and got immediately shit canned after we sent it through. He didn't see vendors as people, so he was shocked that his words towards us counted against his three-strike policy. Apparently, he melted down completely as he was being fired. He said it was all because we were incompetent, but the other four team leads had all put in their numbers and said that it wasn't on our end. Their products were slaying. Wish I could have seen it. I imagine he came home to a very angry wife as well. We are all hitting the bar tonight in his honor. F*** you, baseball dad. Ah, he deserved all of that. 100%. So great to see someone who was abusing their power just get it right up the ass. Thank you for watching everyone. If you want something a little different than my usual narrations, then check out my r slash madlads video. I spent like 13 hours making that, so if you check it out, that would really mean a lot to me. Anyways, until next time, I'll see y'all later. Nuclear Feline Revenge Crazy Entitled Neighbor Tries to Bleach My Sister's Cat Cat Gets Revenge I count this as a nuclear revenge story, but not in the traditional sense. This happened many years ago. My older sister had this awful b neighbor who had a serious hard-on for Sis's seal point Siamese cat. I'll call neighbor CN for crazy neighbor. Sister is Sis, me is self-explanatory. CN was a black-haired plump 40-something divorcee who annoyed everyone in the neighborhood. She had zero understanding of personal boundaries and liked to come over to people's homes, barge in, and look, snoop around, opening drawers and cabinets and touching their stuff. Once she even went into someone's fridge and grabbed herself a ginger ale, then got mad when the homeowner took it back. If you left your door front or back unlocked for more than 10 minutes, chances were she'd just come right in. She stole yard decorations from other people's yards and had been caught on more than one occasion pocketing something she'd snack off a mantle or table of a house she'd invaded. And she would always throw a tantrum when she got busted. Cops had been called on her many times, but she was good at being pathetic, so most people didn't press charges. Unfortunately, this made her bolder. Basically, she was the entitled bitch of the neighborhood. Sis was, unfortunately, one of her favorite victims. She'd come over without calling, barge her way in, and ask, demand, to see Sis's cat, telling Sis how beautiful he was and how much she wanted a cat just like him. Sis, being rather non-confrontational, would let her see the cat, who did not like the woman, then make her leave. CN never wanted to leave and had to basically be pushed out the door. Oh, and she despised me because I wouldn't let her in when I answered the door, nor would I tolerate her BS in any way if she got past my sister. CN was so obsessed with the cat and offered to buy him many times. But Sis loved that cat. He'd been the runt of the litter and rejected by his mom. 
My sister had taken him in and bottle fed him, mothered him, and saved his life. He wasn't a pet, he was her child. So sis of course always said no. This royally pissed off CN. One day the cat got out, he wasn't an outdoor cat, so sis and I immediately started looking for him. We were checking the bushes and behind the flower pots in our backyard when we heard a very distinct yowl, one of pure rage, followed by a very human shriek of pain coming from Cien's house. Suddenly, the doggy door on Cien's back door slams open and outruns my sister's cat, his tail and one rear paw covered in what smelled like hair bleach. I'm allergic to bleach and immediately recognized the smell as he passed me, dashing past us and into Sis's house. Next thing you know, Sian's back door slams open and out she comes, cursing up a blue streak. Ragged claw marks adorned her left cheek and one of her hands had a deep bite wound that had completely saturated one of the gloves, the kind one gets with any hair coloring kit, she was wearing and running down her hand and arm. Turned out when the cat had gotten out, Sian had grabbed him, took him inside and tried to use hair bleach to bleach the brown out of his tail and paws, in order to change his appearance so she could keep him. Unfortunately for her, she didn't know sh about Siamese cats and just how violent they can be. They were originally temple guardians for a reason, lol. The moment Sian put that bleach on that cat's tail, he went absolutely berserk, letting out that yowl of rage we'd heard, clawing up Sian's face and sinking his fangs deep into her hand. She pushed herself between the bushes, the ones that looked like tall green paintbrush heads, Sis used to separate the property line and began yelling. No, not yelling, shrieking. She shrieked that Sis's cat had wandered into her kitchen while she was cooking, and when she tried to pick him up, he attacked her for no reason. Clearly, this was total BS. CN then proceeded to call Sis the N-word several times, she's half black, and me an effing half-breed wetback sl- I'm half Hispanic, we have different dads. She screamed that my sis was stupid for keeping such a dangerous animal and that my sis would be paying for her medical bills. She then got right in my sister's face, pushed my sister hard in the chest with her uninjured hand, saying she was calling animal control and intended to have that thing put down. Sian opened her mouth to say, shriek, some more, but sis, after hearing the last statement and without one word or warning, hauled off and decked her. She landed on her butt in the grass, now clutching her left eye. Sis then loudly suggested Sian go screw herself with a hot curling iron, then ran inside to find her poor cat, while I called the cops. The whole thing from start to end lasted only about five minutes. Sis found him hiding in the laundry room and quickly cleaned him off in the sink. Meanwhile, Sian is still on her ass in our backyard, howling like a banshee until the cops arrived. I told them what happened and they later talked to my sister, after she tendered to the cat, who gave them the same story I did, even admitting to hitting Cien in self-defense of course. It didn't hurt her case that Cien had left a bloody handprint on my sister's shirt when she shoved her. Cien of course told them something entirely different. Her story was that she was about to bleach her hair when my sister's cat came in and attacked her. She also said that both Sis and I attacked her too. I apparently kicked her in the stomach after Sis punched her, but the cops found no evidence of bruising, and the scratches on her face kind of masked her swelling eye. I also think the cops turned a blind eye, pun intended, to it considering the circumstances, but since there was a clear blood trail leading into CN's open back door, cops felt they had probable cause to go in. I think if CN had been paying more attention, she'd have refused them entry. The blood trail led to a sink in the first floor bathroom. Blood, cat fur, a bleach applicator, and the box it came in were in the sink and on the floor. The cat's collar was in the garbage. Sian kept trying to play victim, but the cops didn't buy it. She got arrested and my sister pressed charges for theft and assault. Sian also got nabbed for possession of stolen goods. Cops found a bunch of DVD players and CD players still in their boxes, sitting on her coffee table and in the spare room next to her bathroom. And she had a bunch of prescription drug bottles with other people's names on her kitchen counter. Turned out she'd also been stealing neighbors' painkillers when she visited them. And since she was a renter, the property owner gave her the boot for breach of contract. She went to jail and had to pay for the cat's vet bill. He was okay, but a bit traumatized and had a yellow patch on his butt, paw, and tail for several months. 
Sian's hand got infected from the cat bite and it turned out it also had caused tendon and nerve damage as well. Moral of the story, stay put of people's houses and have the common sense not to mess with a cat named Lucifer. Ooh, I like that name for a cat. So, not only was this nuclear revenge for the cat, but this was also kind of nuclear justice for everyone in the neighborhood. I mean, that ending there, what turns out she had been stealing prescription bottles, DVD players, and all that stuff. I mean, ugh. justice has finally been served and it was on the nuclear level. So, kind of, I kind of want an r slash nuclear justice to be created now. That'd be kind of cool. Anyways, let's move on. Creepy Eveling Wrestling Coach gets what's coming to him. Disclaimer, this is a story that happened to me in high school over five years ago, and I was encouraged to share it. This is a really long one, but you'll love how it ends. I promise. Background, my parents separated early in my childhood, around five to six years old, but both remained very cordial and friendly with each other. They agreed that both parents should be involved, so they shared custody of my younger brother and I. Shortly after separating, they both started seeing other people, and they have been a part of my life ever since. They are, in essence, my step-parents without the official title. There is no animosity between my parents and step-parents whatsoever. Now, my mom does not wear makeup, but she looks really young. Like, she has been confused on many occasions to be my sister. I don't know if it's her genes or she found the fountain of youth, but she is very attractive. This is all important, as you'll see. So, I joined the intramural wrestling team because I was bullied a lot and needed a place to let off some steam. I was a sensitive teenager and going to wrestling practice was my form of therapy. I even joined an outside wrestling club a few towns away I'll call WC. While there I had many coaches including the main coach of the story I'll call Coach Mitch. Mitch was a total douchebag, one of those jocks who brags about how drunk he got, how many girls he banged, and how many illegal things he did. He would walk into wrestling club with his black leather jacket, a backwards cap, and sunglasses and talk up a storm about his nightly conquests. Wrestling was his life and his job at wrestling club was the most important thing to him. On the mat, he was a rough and strict coach who prided himself on his insane cardio training program. If you did anything not to his standards, you would get a stare full of anger and hate we called the Mitch Glare and sent to run gassers. I went to every single one of those practices and he remembered my face. I joined high school and the high school wrestling team as a freshman, but ultimately didn't wrestle much due to a concussion and other injuries. After the wrestling season ended, the head coach announced he was leaving the team to help his wife diagnose with breast cancer, and there would be a new head coach next year. Sophomore year rolls around and there was an announcement for students to meet the new wrestling head coach after school. So. I got with a bunch of old teammates and new recruits, and in walks Mitch with a leather jacket and a stride full of swagger. My heart sank. After the meeting, Mitch pulled me aside and he told me he expected great things from me after wrestling in his WC program. The first year under Mitch was hell and difficult to adjust to, but I managed. I made varsity for the first time, but I wasn't skilled enough to win many of the matches which Mitch did not let me live down. Every opportunity he got after a loss to make his frustration known, he seized. I would often look to the sidelines to see him giving me the Mitch glare. I was disappointed with my season and desperately wanted to improve. I went back to WC that summer with a renewed sense of purpose. I went to every single practice that spring and summer, including Mitch's session, and the improvements were noticeable to everyone. Everyone except Mitch. After one practice in the summer, Coach Mitch told me that he wanted me and another wrestler to come 30 minutes ahead of practices to practice takedowns. I agreed I would, eager to hopefully get on his good side. I should have said no. One day over the summer, my mom drove me to wrestling club and we arrived before Mitch so the doors were locked. Since it was a hot sunny day, my mom stayed until Mitch came. We were chatting when around the corner came Mitch's black Cadillac and parked right next to us. I thanked my mom for the ride and got out of the car to greet Mitch. As I walk a few feet away, my mom rolls down the passenger window and yells to me that I forgot my water bottle. I go back and reach to the window to grab my water bottle and turn around to get a face full of Mitch. I was about to say something, but Mitch, in one fluid motion, shoved me aside with his arm, put his right hand on the roof above the passenger window, and reached his head inside the passenger window. To my horror, he begins to flirt with my mom right in front of me. At first, Mitch thought that she was my older sister, but... Then he realized she was my mom, which made him very interested. I managed to extract him from the window and we went inside. 
Once inside, he refused to do anything except talk about my mom. It was very unsettling to hear a 30 year old man talk about getting with your mom. When I told him that she was with my stepdad, he scoffed and said for now. The rest of the summer and into my junior year was constant torment from Mitch about my mom. It was not long until Mitch brought up to all the wrestlers and my teammates about how hot my mom was, how he was going to rock her world and bed, and how he was going to replace my stepdad and I would call him dad. My teammates laughed and joined in on the tormenting. They even replaced the words of that classic song, Stacy's Mom, to my mom. Every single bus ride to a meet or tournament, Mitch would blast that song. Every. Single. One. Teammates and Mitch would send texts in the group chat about my mom and videos of them singing to that damn song. Mitch would often look up into the stands for my mom, who was a regular at the meets, and would tell me while I'm warming up that she'll be coming home with him afterwards. While this was all going on, I felt embarrassed and powerless, but also angry. I kept my head down and pretended like it didn't affect me, despite the fact it did. I thought if I pretended like it didn't affect me, that he would lose interest and stopped, but it never stopped. My junior season was incredible from a wrestling standpoint. I won numerous tournaments including sectionals and went to states where I lost the round prior to placing. Sectionals and states are the equivalent to the playoffs in football, baseball, etc. I vowed to return next year and place at states. Senior year came and I was winning tournaments and matches again. And while Mitch never got on me for my wrestling, the tormenting of my mom continued despite the fact at this point he had a girlfriend. Many times after walking off the mat, Mitch would come up to me and tell me that it was a good thing I won because he didn't want his stepson to be a loser. This made me rage on the inside but I refused to give him the satisfaction of a response. But there is only so much I could take and there was gonna be a day that I finally snap. It was the weekend before sectionals and we were at the league tournament where I was about to face my arch rival from a few towns away in the finals. I was pumped because we had faced each other in the finals of last year's league tournament and I won. I was warming up off to the side of my mom, stepdad, and dad all sitting together in the stands. I was on deck when Mitch strolled over to me and told me that I better beat this punk or I wouldn't have a bed when he and my mom got married. I pretended not to hear him, but that made my blood boil. I ended up losing the match, and was really upset with myself as I ran off the mat to retrieve my clothes. And seeing the opportunity to kick me while I'm down, Mitch barrels towards me, gets chest to chest with me, and starts yelling in my face in front of the whole gym, although not loud enough for everyone to hear. He was telling me that I should be embarrassed, that I would never amount to anything, and that he doesn't know if he could marry my mom anymore because he would be associated with a loser. I lost it. I shoved Mitch away and told him to fuck off and stormed out of the gym into the parking lot through the back doors. I was so angry and frustrated that I was seeing red. My parents saw what happened but could not hear it and my dad ran after me. He caught me in the parking lot shaking from anger and helplessness. I wouldn't talk to him and told him to leave me alone. As he turned to leave, Mitch entered the parking lot. Mitch glared in full effect and told me that I was suspended indefinitely from the wrestling team. I didn't say anything to him as he walked away. I returned to my dad and told them we need to talk tonight and to grab my mom and stepdad. It was time to get my revenge on the man who tortured me for years. I returned inside to collect my medal and to take a few forced pictures on the podium. I did not return to the team bus and instead had my mom and stepdad drive me home. I spilled everything during that car ride home. Their collective reaction was horror, rage, and disgust. My stepdad, who is an avid health nut and gym rat as well as a former wrestler, wanted to introduce Mitch to his fists, but we convinced him that was not the way to settle this. They vowed to not let this go unpunished and together we hatched a plan. We were going to take everything from him. That Monday came and my mom, dad, and I called a meeting with the vice principal, the principal, the athletic director, and the superintendent. I recounted the entire saga all the way back to wrestling club and showed them the texts and videos from the group chat. Unbeknownst to me at the time, my dad who always videotaped my matches so I could review them later, caught the exchange between Mitch and me but without the audio. The men stared in horror as I shared everything, like wide-eyed fish gasping for air. 
Then, my mom turns to the men and tells them that she has been in contact with a lawyer and that they are planning on suing under Title IX against the district for sexual harassment unless something was done immediately. I did not know if we actually could sue and if this was a bluff, but the effect was instantaneous. I have never seen a group of four men flinch in unison together and stumble over one another to assure us that they would take action immediately. Mitch was fired that day, but we did not stop there. Mitch was so enchanted by my mom, right? So much so, he sent text messages and videos to proclaim how much he wanted to be with my mom. Well, I found Mitch's girlfriend on Facebook and sent her over all those messages and videos and told her how he had tortured me for close to two years. She was livid. I wish I could have been there for the fight that ensued, but she dumped his ass and their relationship status turned to single. But we did not stop there. My mom and I then returned to wrestling club later that spring and talked to the manager and other coaches about Mitch's behavior towards me while the member of wrestling club. At first, they didn't fully believe the story, but after showing them the messages and videos as well as having some legal persuasion from my mom, they quickly backpedaled and assured us that there was no place for that behavior at wrestling club. We stood at the counter with the manager as Mitch walked through the door. The look of horror that crossed Mitch's face was absolutely priceless. While we could not be present for the dismissal in the office, we watched as Mitch reappeared from the office and left wrestling club with his stupid Mitch glare on his face. My mom and I high-fived in the car and laughed the entire way home. To finish the season, my suspension was revoked and the assistant coach was promoted to interim head coach. I ended up placing fourth at States that year and it was the proudest moment of my life. I had dealt with so much drama that I felt all of it was finally worth it and I had accomplished my ultimate goal. We had won the battle against Mitch. I placed at States and I was going to a great college to wrestle with a nice scholarship. But it does not end there. That summer, going to my first year at college, I dislocated my arm at the shoulder and tore my labrum, which required surgery. The morning of the surgery came and my mom was driving me to the hospital when we came across a brown and gray pickup truck broken down in the right shoulder. My mom slows down because it's a one lane road with oncoming traffic on the left. As we pull alongside the truck, from the front of the truck around the driver's side, step Mitch in a yellow safety vest and tan cargo shorts. Time seemed to slow as we made eye contact and his face twisted into that Mitch glare. Gone was his nice black Cadillac and nice clothes and replaced with a broken pickup truck and construction attire. As we drove by, my mom and I looked at each other, asked if we both saw him, and then laughed ourselves all the way to the hospital. Karma is great. Oh, and uh, to this day, I still cannot listen to Stacy's mom. There's a fine line between encouraging your students to do better in a sport and then crossing that line entirely to the point where it completely ruins and shatters them. And Mitch managed to find where that line was and um, decided to do the 100 meter dash across it. So, yeah. Yeah. My granddad destroys the life of guy who tried to kill my dad. I got to reading these and remembered the epic story of revenge that my granddad got after a guy tried to decapitate my dad. So a thing to note is that my granddad was a brigadier general who took part in the allied invasion of Italy and was an excellent strategist who had the respect of everyone in town. However, he raised a family of smartasses. So, in 1974, my dad was in high school and lived in a small town in Massachusetts and, like his older siblings, was a smartass and a bit of a troublemaker called in bomb threats to get out of school, sort of thing. Well, one day someone vandalized the house of one of the teachers. We'll call him Mr. P. Not sure exactly what happened, but I think it was something along the lines of trashing a garage and throwing paint all over. Mr. P had long hated my family, as my aunts and uncles and dad would mock him because he wasn't a particularly intelligent teacher and his students would often correct him. For some reason, Mr. P was convinced it was my dad who did it. He would have probably blamed my aunts and uncles too, but they were all in Vietnam at the time. And for whatever reason, he had the genius idea to try to kill my dad in response. My dad has always been an avid motorcyclist, and at the time, he would frequently give girls rides past Mr. P's house, and he liked to go fast. One night after a school function, a dance I think, 
My dad was giving a girl a ride home, and her place was two or three houses down from Mr. Pete. He dropped her off and was starting to speed off home when he noticed a metal wire strung across the street between two poles right at neck height for anyone riding a motorcycle. It was pretty obvious that this trap was meant for him, and had my dad been speeding down the street like normal, it likely would have decapitated him. Needless to say, my dad was both freaked out and pissed. He rushed home to get my granddad and showed him the wire. My granddad was normally a calm and collected man who had seen a lot and had military stoicism. But upon seeing the trap laid out to kill his son, my dad said he was more furious than he had ever been in his life. They went to all the houses in the area and got everyone's attention and demanded to know who set the trap. They found out it was Mr. P when someone told my granddad that Mr. P had mentioned something about getting revenge on my dad for vandalizing his house. When they confronted Mr. P, he didn't deny it and my granddad promptly punched him in the face, knocking him out, and they went home. When they got home, my granddad interrogated my dad, demanding to know if he was the actual vandal. He was not. Mr. P was disliked by many of his students, and we never learned who actually did it. With that settled, my granddad said he would destroy Mr. P if it was the last thing he did. That he would end him for having the nerve to try to kill his son. At this point, my granddad started planning his personal war on Mr. P, but I'm not super sure of all the details because he intentionally left my dad out of much of it. So I only have what my dad was involved with and what we found out later. What we know is that my granddad reached out to a number of his contacts who served with him in World War II, told them what happened, and recruited them for Operation Black Paint. Yes, that's what he really called it. First, in the summer of 1974, they broke into his house and sabotaged the plumbing, causing a toilet on the second floor to flood sh water all over. And the local plumber, who was in on the operation, while fixing the pipe, did something that caused the hot water tank to explode a few days later, further wrecking Mr. P's house. This apparently happened during a rough time in Mr. P's marriage, and these stresses apparently pushed it over the edge and they got divorced. And while he doesn't have proof, my dad believes this was part of the plan. Later that year, just as school was starting, my granddad had someone remove the lug nuts from Mr. P's car, which predictably caused him to get into an accident. Mr. P was uninjured, but his car was wrecked. He was still broke from having to do the repairs caused by the plumbing incidents. Without a car, he frequently struggled to get to and from the school, and my dad would laugh at him driving by on his motorcycle while Mr. P walked to work. We also know that my granddad turned him into an alcoholic leaving bottles of booze on his porch with a note saying things along the lines of, heard you were having a rough time, here, take the pain off. Throughout the school year, Mr. P was growing increasingly stressed and depressed and his alcoholism began to show. In about March of 1975, my granddad gave my dad a bottle of scotch and told him to put it in Mr. P's desk at school on the promise my dad would get a bottle of scotch for himself. He did, and that evening the principal got a call saying Mr. P had been seen drinking on the job. Mr. P was fired after they found a half-empty bottle of scotch in his desk. Jobless, careless, recently divorced, depressed and alcoholic, Mr. P decided to try to sell his home and start over somewhere else. My granddad also made this hell, as he had several people look at the house and had them sabotage it further while they were there, such as pouring glue into the kitchen sink and locking up the garbage disposal, salting the yard, and causing various small bits of damage to the property, while complaining at the poor state of the place. Eventually, Mr. P gave up selling it and just walked away with only the clothes on his back. My family sort of lost track of Mr. P for a few years before finding out he was a homeless wretch on the streets of Boston and was still a raging alcoholic. In February of 1978, with a historic snowstorm bearing down on them, my granddad found Mr. P under a bridge where he confronted him, told him that he was the one who had destroyed his life and why. He then poured his soda onto Mr. P, walked away, and proceeded to let him freeze to death that night. Holy hell. Oh my god, uh, moral of the story, don't try to decapitate the son of a World War II veteran. My god. Like, holy hell. Revenge of the Bullied Butterfly Effect. The Prelude. I was a sweet, nerdy boy when I was a child. I was interested in science, computers, avionics, and mechanics. I was also slightly on the heavier side, but not so much that it would disqualify me from playing sports with other kids. In my school, I was generally liked by my peers, so I never have been in physical conflict until that summer. When I was 10, my parents sent me to the summer camp for two weeks. This was something I was looking forward to for months. As soon as we arrived at the camp, things have gone sideways pretty quickly. 
And I have a crap load of repressed memories about that period, but I do remember this one guy in particular. Let's call him Ringleader, RL. I tried to resist the bullying and fight back, but he was two to three years older, and the difference in sheer physical power was overwhelming. He also got several other boys and girls on his side, so it was impossible for me to mount any kind of effective defense. The fact that the camp supervisors, the adults, knew about this and ignored this entirely did not help either. Keep in mind this was during the 90s in a post-Soviet country, cell phones were not a thing back then, so I've had no option to contact my parents about what was going on. My mornings at the camp, and I mean every single morning, would start with Ringleader and several other of his degenerate friends throwing a bedsheet over my head while I was still sleeping and beating me up. They called this the blanket. I never knew exactly who was present as I was busy trying to cover my head and face from the blows. This would repeat in some shape or form several times over the day, basically every time the supervisors were not present and sometimes even in the middle of the night. Some nights I would wake up basically covered in spit and snot. While Ringleader was waiting there laughing with his band, they of course restricted me from using a bathroom to clean myself up. And this was a point of immense entertainment and bragging stories for them. In one instance, I remember the Ringleader getting up from his bed during the night, pissing on me while I was asleep, and then waking the whole camp up, telling everyone that I had wet the sheets like a little baby. I was even reprimanded by the supervisors and the nickname Piss Boy stuck for the whole remainder of the hell camp. The ringleader even tried to coax me to give him a handjob on the occasion in order for him to stop bullying me. Rest assured he was not successful, I was defeated but not broken. After returning from this camp, I have told my parents about some of the stuff, but kept the most hardcore parts to myself. I was too ashamed. My father was an ex-soldier and a senior ranking intelligence officer investigator at the time, but even he was unable to do much about it within the limits of the law. When my father tried to confront him, the ringleader's father basically told us to screw off and to add insult to injury, blame the situation on me for being a little pussy. This was done on the intercom in front of their house. He did not even see us. I don't mean to go into much detail here, but the fact is that this summer effectively ended my childhood and started a chain of events that would end up with me being the way I am now. The long-term impact. You see, in my late 20s, I have been diagnosed with borderline antisocial personality disorder. Basically, I am a sociopath. Apart from other things, this means that I have very little capacity for empathy or any other emotion for that matter. I can on occasion get happy, angry, sad, or even scared, but the stimuli for this have to be pretty strong and I also have to choose to feel something. I, in particular, do have a deep distrust towards authorities, hate incompetence and neglectfulness, and do not shy from physical, psychological, or emotional confrontation if I deem it necessary. This personality adjustment is not entirely a bad thing for me either. I am able to remain entirely composed in high stress or hostile situations and can also read people extremely well, since my bias and emotions rarely play a role in my assessments. This led me to some pretty interesting career choices over the years since people with my disposition are pretty rare and valuable in different roles. Contrary to popular belief, sociopaths are not entirely malicious. We do not go out of our way to harm some random people just for hex and giggles or because we are bored. We need a damn good reason to do nefarious stuff. But when we have one, we execute flawlessly. Fast forward 10-ish years. I was working as a security guard in one of the more frequent bars in my city. This was not the kind of security guard that you would imagine guarding a mall or pulling a night shift in an administrative building. We always worked in teams of two and instead of badges and uniforms, our standard equipment would consist of civilian clothing, a melee weapon of our choosing, leather gloves, and a concealed firearm, which I fortunately never have had to use. We of course were prohibited from drinking in the establishment, even on off-duty hours, but were otherwise required to socialize with the patrons and to generally appear non-threatening. Most of the nights, it would be pretty quiet and mellow since most of the people knew not to screw around with the staff for other customers and even appreciated the extra lay of security. On one such night, I was sitting and chatting with some of our regulars, part of the job appeared normal and non-threatening, when all of a sudden, the ringleader enters the establishment. He did not recognize me so far and he also appeared drunk as hell. However, in short time, he started verbally abusing one of our waitresses. In circumstances like these, we employ a one-strike rule. You got one warning from the staff and if you did not change your behavior on the spot and permanently, you would be forcibly removed. My colleague, who was closer and had a better overview of the situation, slowly approached the guy and asked him to stop insulting the waitress. Although I did not pay attention, I wanted to distance myself from this situation as much as possible, since I knew that if Ringleader recognized me, the situation would probably escalate rapidly. Suddenly, the Ringleader grabbed an empty bottle of beer from the table and hit the colleague over his right elbow, doing some pretty significant damage. He threw the bottle away and ran for it immediately. I quickly checked on my colleague, instructed the staff to call the cops, and then follow the Ringleader outside. As soon as I got out, I realized the mother 
soccer ringleader was completely sober and that he had two other friends outside. They did this on purpose and were trying to provoke a street fight all along. I was unsure if he knew who I was or if he was targeting me on purpose, but I was not 10 years old anymore. I took out my baton and proceeded with the engagement. The mother even had the balls to call me a pussy and ask for a one-on-one -on -one without the baton. They did not bring any weapons, so as soon as the first one fell to the ground, the ringleader and his remaining friend decided to flee. I was not about to let ringleader get away from this kind of bull****. I caught up to him in less than 100 meters. I did actually only use the necessary force to make him comply to my kind request to come back to the front of the bar and let the cops sort it out. As we relatively calmly waited for the police to arrive, I realized he indeed did not know who I was, and I was not about to spoil the fun. They arrived like three minutes later. They informed me that they were looking for a group of guys provoking fights in this manner over the last month, and asked if I wanted to press charges. Of course we did. My colleague who almost got his elbow shattered was unable to attend work for several months. His friend that I had put down in front of the bar even tried to press charges against the establishment, but it was quickly dismissed as reasonable self-defense since there was no lasting damage. I assume my name must have come up during the proceeding, but the ringleader never connected the dots between myself as a 10-year-old boy and my new self. The best part? The ringleader was already up for sexual assault charges, and while arresting the ringleader, the kind officers even found drugs on the dumb mother it was just a small amount of ganja, but you could get served with some serious time just for that back then. Of course, he claimed somebody had planted the drugs. Why would anyone do that to him though? I'll never know. Lots of repressed memories, as I have said. In the end, he was sent to jail for three years. Did I mention my father was an intelligence officer? I believe I did. Well, my father was already dead by this time, but most of his old friends were not. Some still working with the law enforcement. One was even overseeing the guards in the jail the ringleader was sent to at the time. I've made sure that my father's friend remembered what happened to me in that summer camp. To put this into context, back at the time our jails were pretty rough. Several of the people working there were still from the old guard, trained but taught by Soviets. This was certainly not a summer camp. Fast forward five years. The Reckoning. I was now running security at the establishment, but the company grew a little bit. We now owned the entire building, which consisted of several stories. Some of our duties consisted of making sure that the upper stories were empty during the nights, as the building was still technically accessible to the public because the bar was open 24-7. During the winter months, we've often had homeless people try to sneak past us and hide within the building, since it could get as low as negative 30 degrees Celsius during the nights. Even if it put our jobs at risk, we've had an unofficial understanding with the security guys. As far as the homeless people were not littering in the place, were not bringing alcohol or raising commotion, and got out before 6 in the morning, we let them sleep, and even wash in some of the unused utility rooms. We even sneak some blankets in. We were not animals, and we realized these people had nowhere else to go. On one such night, I was checking the floors, making sure that nothing nefarious was going on, when suddenly I hear somebody snoring in one of the utility rooms. I knew it was one of the homeless people, but I still needed to check for damage and alcohol. Upon closer inspection, I found Ringleader sleeping there. He lost a lot of weight from the last time I've seen him, and was in overall bad shape. Later I learned that he had had serious mental and emotional problems because of the treatment he got in the prison, because he was bullied heavily by the inmates and the guards did absolutely nothing about it. This led to heavy substance abuse once he got released, eventually getting him into serious debt, and not the nice clean debt towards the banks I mind you. His parents had to eventually sell the house just to cover it for him. They moved to a small apartment and kicked him out onto the streets. Standing there, I'm thinking about cutting the guy a slack. Thinking he's been through enough already, I turn towards the door intent on leaving him be. Then I remember how he f pissed on me while I was asleep and made it look like I wet the bed. I remember how he and his punks beat me several times a day for two weeks straight. I remember him barring me access from the bathrooms while I was covered in dried snot and spit and laughing and bragged about it later. I remember him trying to coax a hand job out of a 10 years old boy. I remember his sh of a father blaming me for all that over the intercom. I remember him injuring my colleague five years ago just to stir shit up. I think about the girl he tried to rape, the sexual assault charge. I break. I put my gloves on and drag the guy by his neck out into the freezing cold. I can clearly see he does not fully comprehend what is happening to him. Still half asleep, once outside, he starts to fuck 
beg. He is trying to appeal to my sense of humanity. Then he gets angry. I quickly reaffirm that he is in no position to be aggressive towards me or anyone else and remind him not to make the same mistake he made five years ago. Then he remembers. Y you you got me into the jail five years ago. You got there yourself, pal. Why are you doing this to me? I don't know. I'm just a horrible kind of person. I genuinely enjoy this. What have I ever done to you? Nothing really. I would stop, but you would have to give me a hand job first. This gives him a pause. Now, I can almost see him connecting the dots in his stupid little head. The wheels are crunching for a while. He then wants to say something, but I see that he realized. He realized everything. He opens his mouth, but not Iota comes out. He simply turns on his heel and takes on into the freezing night. Later that night, I let all the security guards know that he is the one who assaulted our guy some years ago, and that he is not to be allowed to stay anywhere near the building under any circumstance. The aftermath. I am now working in an entirely different field in a different company. I am head of IT and research and development branch, but are often invited to lead negotiations by other department heads, particularly the more problematic hostile kind. The kind where customers try to renegotiate prices after our part of the contract is fulfilled, or refuse to pay for services work done at all. My particular talents come in pretty handy in these situations. I know how it sounds, but this is all within legal means. It's just that my shitty country has pretty shitty judicial system and virtually zero protections against customers screwing contractors, providers, after they finish the job delivery of the product. Our company is currently entering a deal to acquire a small business providing various recreational services, including running summer camps for children. As far as I can tell, some of the employees have been working there for more than 20 years. Ringleader survived the winter. He lost some fingers due to frostbite, but nothing major. I still sometimes see him around the city, and it always puts a smile on my face. I make a point of giving the poor guy some cash each time I meet him, since I know he will inevitably spend it on drugs and booze. Ah, don't you just love it when karma comes full circle? Hey, you made it to the outro. Don't forget that this whole thing is pretty much brought to you by Gamersups. Use code eyes at checkout. If you like caffeine, this is basically the thing for you. Not to mention, every sale made using code eyes at checkout gets me a little bit in return. You support the channel by using that code. Plus, Gamer Subs isn't chock full of that extra stuff that you would find in a pre-workout blend, so you can get that caffeine that you love without putting stuff in your system that's made for you to be exercising with it, which is phenomenal. I love this stuff. I actively use it. Firstly, my current favorite flavor is actually Dragon Fruit Punch or Soda Pressing Pear. These two love them so much. Drink them on a daily basis, essentially. So, uh, so yeah, go go use Code Odds at checkout and support the channel. They also have a section, so if you don't like anime, you don't have to have a bunch of degenerate shit. <laughs>